fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And joining us now on the line is Harry McLean. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure, Al. Um, first, uh, before we get into the story, um, what got you into writing in Broad Daylight and, and the Skidmore um, killing? Well, I think like a lot of people in college, I told myself one day I was going to write a novel, you know. Um, well, I lost the fiction bug, but I got kind of, I was, I always liked In Cold Blood. Um, and then I'd been practicing law for about 15 years at that point, and I was pretty bored with it. And one day, day I opened Newsweek and there's a story um, of, of uh, a vigilante killing in northwest Missouri. That was the headline. And it had a picture of, I think I sent the picture, I sent two more pictures to you and I think one of them is the picture that was in Newsweek. It's Ken McElroy holding his daughter looking right into the camera. It's a pretty um, intimidating glare to get a feel for who he is just looking up. Anyway, I saw that in um, vigilante killing uh, that it got a lot of play at the time, and I grew up in the Midwest, and I thought, well, there's a good story out there. So one day after thinking about it for a couple of months, I got in my car and drove out there. Pretty incredible story. Now, he had um, a pretty um, rough upbringing, and he was, what, 15th of 16 children? He was 12 out of 12, yeah. Oh, and um, let's see what he he only made it to eighth grade, and um, so he was charged twenty one different times for uh, different um, minor crimes like uh, th- theft and uh, uh, rustling and stuff like that. Well, that that number twenty one includes some pretty serious crimes. Um, that includes the charges against Trina. Um, for a rape and child molestation and a range of other charges when she was when she was 13 this story goes and I know it's true he got a hold of her and um, had a long sexual affair with her and they ended up uh, charging him with several counts of rape child rape whatever the phrasing was in, in Missouri I can't quite remember but that's the essence of it and uh, he outwitted the law once again he got his he got a divorce and got Trina's parents to consent to him marrying her by burning their barn down and then um, told the DA, you know, my client's married to the witness, to the victim witness, and she's renouncing the whole story. So he got away with that. Um, but, yeah, no, there's a lot of serious assault charges in there, too. What was his method? Like, how did he get away with so many crimes? Like, like, what was the pro- problem with the policing then? Well, you know, the large picture is he it was a combination of reality and myth. Uh, he did a lot of things in a kind of intuitively smart way. Um, and then he also told people, if you do anything about it, I'll burn your house down or I'll, I'll follow your, your daughter home from school on the bus and pick her up or I'll, you know, come and blow your guts out with a shotgun, all of which he did at one time or another. And so it, it, the, the myth grew out of a number of incidents, so it's not like it's not true, but it grew larger than reality, so that all he had to do was drive his truck into town, word would spread on telephone, and all doors would be locked and lights would be shut off, and all businesses would close. Um, was your question how oh he he, he he sensed people's weaknesses an intuitive sense for either a system like the law enforcement system uh, or an individual's weakness in how to exploit it 
with this system, with the legal system, he figured out early on that if you didn't have a witness, you didn't have a case. So case after case after case after case that were filed against him, St. Joe, a lot of them were in St. Joe, a lot of them were in other counties. The witnesses disappeared or changed their story. And so the cases were dropped. Uh, but, you know, didn't the police kind of catch on with all of these uh, crimes, one after another? And then it got into the rape and then the shooting. Um, weren't they kind of watching him or weren't they trying to get him? Well, they were scared of him, too, most of them. Um, I had a, I tracked two situations where um, county sheriffs, deputies, were driving into Skidmore when it came over the radio that he was in town and they turned on the left. Um, there was one, there was one cop that would stand up to him. Uh, he was a state patrolman, Corporal Richard Stratton. And, uh, he stood right up to McElroy toe to toe. They pulled guns on each other. It's a long story. Um, but he, he managed to isolate law enforcement. He, you know, so that they, he would, he would, uh, turn one on the other one, but he he found the weaknesses, and it was a uh, not a strong law enforcement presence anyway. It's it's uh, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, and I thought I, I you know in the Midwest is the Midwest. Uh, Missouri is I came to see is as much the South as anything else. It sits right on top of Arkansas. It was a slaveholding state. They, at least in this town at that time, and well, in all of Northwest Missouri at that time, there just was not a strong government presence. They didn't want it. It's just people took care of their own problems. And he understood that, and, and he knew how to exploit that weakness in the system. Now, now when he got together, when he was having that affair or... Um assaulting um, Trina McLeod, he actually moved her in with his uh, third wife and kids. How, right. how did he do, how did he get away with that? Like how, was he, was he just, did he have those um, a woman really scared of him or what was the deal? Well, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, he was, you know, that, it's a rural area, obviously, and Ken McElroy had a lot of, a lot of cash. And he, in his younger days, he was good looking. And he drove a big fancy car. So, and he kind of approached women that were, or girls that were on the lower section of the economic scale. And they were greatly impressed by him. And, uh, he originally slept, had an affair with Trina's mother. And then ended up with Trina herself, starting when she's like 12 and a half to 13. I can't quite remember, um, the exact, how exact, uh, old she was. But so he had this power, he had this respect. When he walked into a bar, the place went silent. Uh, when he walked into a grocery store, everybody else left. Uh, nobody ever gave him, you know, he just had this, like I say, this larger in life powerful thing. And that attracted a lot of these women. And then they got into relationships with him and he was extremely abusive um, and beat him up and raped them. It went on and on, but um, at one time, Trina started having kids by him after they, well, actually, it was before they got married, and she and Alice Wood, who had been a girlfriend of his, still was, both lived out at the ranch and both had kids by him, and both of them were in the same hospital at the same time giving birth to kids, if you can imagine that. Jeez. Wow. Uh, <laughs> now, so what was the... Um Maybe explain the big event uh, about the uh, his child stealing something in the store, kind of the one that kind of set it all off. Yeah. Um, McCoy's kids, two of uh, three, there were three of his daughters by his first wife, um, Sharon, and they stopped into the B and G grocery store, which was owned by Bo and Lois Bowen Camp. And um, they did a little shopping, and Bo- Lois pointed out to the girl, one of the youngest girls was, pointed out to the older sister that the younger one was walking out with a couple of jawbreakers that hadn't been paid for. 
and without going into all the details of the conversation, that got back to McElroy that his daughter had been accused of stealing. And that set the whole final play in motion. McElroy soon started terrorizing the Bowen camps, driving around his house in a caravan of trucks with shotguns hanging out the window, shooting the shotguns off in the middle of the night over the roof of the house, following their daughter in a car, on and on for about a, a month period. He was on them heavy, and he freaked them out, and he freaked the town out um, because they knew something was going to happen, and something did happen. Um, July of 80, he approached uh, the older bone camp, Bo. He was in the back of the store. It was a, on a dock, actually, and some dispute as to what actually happened, but McElroy tried to kill him, took a shotgun, and stuck it in his neck and pulled the trigger. The last second, Bo kind of dodges to the side, and it rips about a third of his neck out. doesn't hit the jugular in his shoulder. And uh, he obviously tried to kill him and didn't. But he went on trial for that. And for the first time, the community held, the witnesses held, um, they backed Bo up. He thought he could intimidate this old man, and he couldn't. He ended up being tougher than he thought. So one day, McElroy comes into town. He brings a weapon, brings a rifle, sets it down on the in the end of the bar, sets it down on the on the table, and makes some provocative remarks about how next time he's going to shoot the old man and kill him. Three guys see it, are in the bar. They go to the sheriff and say. He's not supposed to have. He's not supposed to have a weapon in his uh, at any time, but particularly in his car or in a public place. And so they swear out a warrant uh, for his arrest. They don't arrest him. What they do is they set a hearing to revoke his bond for having a, a weapon. And the bond hearing is set, say like it's set on Thursday. The whole community closes around these three guys who signed the affidavit saying they saw him with the rifle. They basically have targets on their backs now, and he's after them. He's after them out in the, out in the back roads. He's after them in the forest, and he, 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 he knows who is trying to put him in jail, and he's, and he's after them. So the whole community, for once, backs up these people. In the past, they've, if somebody got in trouble with McElroy, they would just hightail it out of it. Because if they came to the defense of the person, McElroy would be on them. In this case, they got together in kind of a group reflex. And, um, and, and they, you want me to tell the story of what actually happened that day? Yeah, yeah. Let's get into the, uh, into the, the crux of what happened. Well, they, they had gathered that morning to drive up to Ravenwood, a town about 30 miles away where the hearing was going to be. He was tried out in Ottawa County. And um, they had about 30 pickup trucks, probably 60 or 70 guys gathered at the Legion Club at the top of the hill in Skidmore and figure out, you know, what they were going to do and how they were going to protect these three guys driving up to Ravenwood for the hearing, and to also kind of counter-intimidate McElroy, too. Well, word comes in that the county attorney, this, uh, yeah, county attorney, had uh, agreed to a continuance of the hearing for a week. And the whole thing was a tinderbox at that point. I mean, it was ready to go, and the guys, the community was all very cohesive in defense of these three guys. And this just snapped it, um, because what that meant was um, these three guys were going to be. Now he was really, now he was really mad because he would hear about this meeting, and he would come after these three guys, and they would have to somehow hold the community community together and protect themselves for another ten days. So they went up and had the meeting anyway, and they said, "What are we going to do about them for the next?" week or 10 days till the next hearing. And they were talking about stuff. And uh, he hears that they're having a meeting about it. Word reaches his farm outside of town. Well, he, of course, has to face them down. Uh, it, for him to not go in 
knowing that would be a great loss of face or however you want to say it. So he gets Trina, who by this time is riding in his tariff truck with him. She's pulling guns on people and riding back up pickups for his assaults and robberies and so forth. And uh, so Trina gets in the truck with him, and they drive into town. They park right in front of the tavern. Um, they go in, they sit down. Then word reaches the guys at Legion Hall that McElroy is in town. Well, now they, their bluff has been called. If they leave town without going down and confronting him, he will have had the absolute upper hand. I mean, he will own that town if if that's what happens, and they know that. So they march down the main street of town. About half of them go in the tavern. Half of them stay outside. It's at 1030 in the morning in July in northwest Skidmore, and uh, he sits there and has a beer, and a couple of people say things to him, and Trina wants to leave. She thinks it's going to go bad. And finally, he buys a six-pack, and they go out the, uh, out the front door and get a pickup. A bunch of people follow him out. A bunch of people stay in the tavern. Up the hill is about 40 people who didn't go into the tavern to start with. And so he's in his truck. He's lighting a cigarette. Um, Trina's anxious, nervous. Two guys, who I believe to be the two killers, exit the rear of the pool hall or bar, cross the street. Their trucks are up a little bit. They're across the street, but they're just uh, up a little bit from McElroy's truck. One of them reaches in to his pickup, pulls out 30-30, and opens up on McElroy through the rear window of McElroy. McElroy's truck. The other one pulls out a shotgun and opens up on McElroy the same way. So originally the 30-30 is the weapon that killed him. And uh, it just hits him right right smack in the back of the head and blows his head up. And blows a lot of it over Trina's lap. And uh, as he's been shot in the back, he's just started the truck and he leans forward and foot and leg go down on the accelerator and the engine roars so you get this scene of all these probably about 60 people now watching the person the monster that they finally brought to ground uh, and this wild roar going on big Silverado 8 cylinder pickup Um, so that's the end of that day I mean he sat in that truck for two hours um Nobody in that town calls for an ambulance or for law enforcement. It's finally they found out about it when Trina calls McElroy's brother and said they killed him. And that's how the eventually the sheriff and the ambulance came into town. Wow. So, so now on, on that, so he, he obviously didn't, expect them to do that he he thought they would just cower to him right well that's a good question i you know he was he was likely going to go to jail and he always said he could not handle jail he wouldn't survive and it would have been huge you know humiliation for him too and i my instinct was that that he really didn't care what happened if if he if he bluffed them or they killed him um and then he, in the movie, they made a movie out of the book in broad daylight. And Brian Denny, he plays McElroy. And he brings this ambiguity out beautifully in the movie. He's sitting in the truck uh, lighting a cigarette. And Trina says to him, Ken, they've got a gun. And he goes on lighting the cigarette as if he didn't know what was going to happen. And so the way I always saw it and the way then he played it was that, all right, I don't think you've got the guts to do it. And if you do, so what? I'm 50 years old. I can't get young girls anymore. I can't go through the woods hunting coons, so let's get it over with. And I wanted to ask you about the movie, too. It's 
I know it's a, a semi-fictionalized movie. They refer to um, the main character as, I believe, Len Rowan in that movie. Yeah. yeah. Did they change the names of that because they were worried about being sued by his family, or was that just to avoid the overall issue of having to pay his estate or anything for using his name? Yeah, no, it, it was all weird to me. I mean, that's, you know, that's the L- L.A. world. And they came up with a fictional name for the town. There's no legal basis to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had fictional names for all the characters in there. And if you're a public figure, you're subject to being, you know, in works of art, portrayed in works of art. And they didn't. So for some reason, everybody's name was changed all the way through it. And they had a scene at the beginning. Oh, he's holding one of the girls in his lap, and they're doing itsy bitsy spider or something, which was just just a creation of the guy, uh, of the screenwriter. But other than those things, the facts of it were pretty true to the book. I I have to say. I mean, every now and then they would put they would dress him in a in a in a leather sports coat or something, you know? yeah. <laughs> and I go screaming up saying, no, no. But other than those things, it was it was pretty true to the book. Well, and it's interesting too. I came across that case and your book years ago because I was a fan of the TV show Quincy, and they oh, did yeah. an mm-hmm. they did an episode about this called I believe it was called Sleeping Dogs, which was a really yeah. fascinating breakdown of how the coroner tried to explain how the shots were fired and who did it and everything from that point of view. But I want to ask you too in that reference there. These two men that you referred to, what do you think it was that drove them to that particular action that particular day? It seems like they felt there was a sense of urgency, and uh, they took this matter into their own hands. That We know he was shot by two different weapons. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, well, the two, uh, it all fits together. I mean, there were two two brothers, Dell and Greg. I'm sorry, one one of the brothers. Del Clement and another uh, fellow who were all, they were ranchers on the north side of town. Ranchers are not farmers. They're horse people and they're cowboys. And they kind of look down on the farmers. I don't want to say that's too simplistic. But, but uh, and the two brothers, Del in particular, was, was a hothead. And McElroy, they were running the tavern. They owned the tavern at that time. Okay. And when McElroy came into town, it closed down. So they were losing money on that. He had also allegedly, and I have, don't have an eyewitness to this, had threatened their horses out at the ranch, threatened to shoot them. Uh, all he had to do was take offense on something. He, he think you insulted him, a member of his family, and the rain of terror started. So he, he was kind of um, trying to provoke them out, of, out on the ranch. And so the morning it happened... Dell, who I believe was the primary shooter, was serving beer behind the bar, and it's my belief, he was, and he was drinking, he was an alcoholic, that he just lost it. When he saw McElroy leave the tavern with Trina, he just thought, you know, we can't keep this step up. I mean, I don't think he thought very hard about it, but it was kind of an emotional reaction, you know? It, well, yeah, because she was still in the car it, right next to him, so... Yeah, it was like this son of a bitch has got to die, you know. He, he's got to die, and I'm going to blow his brains out. He walked out, walked across the street to his car, and he just started blowing his brains out. It, and this is a big thing, a big distinction that always um, really bothered the town and bothers me too, actually, is that they called it a vigilante act, a town killing. It was not a town killing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was not a group decision to kill McElroy. Yeah. Um, it was a couple guys just losing it under the stress of, and alcohol. Now, I'm curious. We know that he was shot by two different weapons. No one's ever been charged with this. Were the police not able to narrow down those weapons to specific individuals, or how, how did that play out? Well, the weapons were, were never identified. They just know the two different weapons from the oh, okay. uh, and shell casings that they did find. Um, what was the rest of your question? I'm sorry. 
I was just curious how that played out with the investigation, you know, that they weren't able to identify the particular guns that were used, then it would be difficult to narrow yeah. down specific specific yeah, individuals. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the problem they had was, was um, you know, with all these eyewitnesses, all, all, and Tina named Del Clement um, in all of her statements. And when I talked to her, uh, I saw Del Clement, I know his car, I know his rifle, it's got this golden lever on it or something, and uh, I know who it was. She swore to that, um, but they felt, prosecutor always felt they needed one more um, person. So, wow, you got 60 witnesses, right? 60 of them come up and identify him. Well, the truth of, and they, not all of them saw him, some stayed in, I'd, I'd say there's 45 that actually saw the shooting. And um, they, over a period of three years, um, they had a county grand jury, a state grand jury, and a federal grand jury down in Kansas City. And they brought these dirt farmers down there and put them under oath. They said, what would you see? Nothing. And without uh, somebody, I mean, everybody, the minute I got to town on the side, I was came to understand who the killers were. There was never any real debate about that. There were some crazy theories that the mob out of Kansas City came up there, but it was, they were all just silly. Um, but, you know, everybody knew who they were, but you had to get a witness to come and swear under oath that these guys were on the guns and did the firing. And in spite of law enforcement's best efforts, including the FBI, they were never able to break a witness. They did, but then the witness recanted that, and so he was worthless. But other than that, um, they never got solid sworn eyewitness testimony as who the killers were, in spite of all those witnesses. And did either of those two suspects ever comment on this directly? Uh, well, not not directly. I mean, I, I, um, they would. They would deny it. Mm-hmm. They would make a statement of, of denial. I never had anything to do with it, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but they never gave any sort of public statement. Or um, and, and I went out to their ranch one day. They were having a rodeo. And um, I watched Del Clement walk off to a barn at some point, and I followed him. And um, into the barn and said, oh, Del, you know, and I uh, said, I'm, I'm here uh, about the story, you know. And I didn't want to even say McElroy's name. He turned around, he's a short guy, and says, uh, maybe you, uh, maybe it's time for you to leave the ranch. And I said, well, I, I'm not trying to figure out who did it or anything. I just want to have a talk with you because I know part of the overall, you know, you know the community and all that stuff. And he reached for a rifle on the wall and said, maybe you didn't hear me. It's time for you to leave. <laughs> and I said, okay, Del, I'm leaving. And mm-hmm. turned around and walked across this field. And I swear to God, I was waiting for the sound of a crack and slug. I mean, not really, but yeah, really. I mean, because he's done it already and he's very impulsive and he's a drunk. So mm-hmm. that's as close to Ira, as Ira came to ask him what his involvement was. Didn't well, I can see why you stopped there. So, yeah, <laughs> wise choice. How how was the rest of the town uh, toward you when you were out there and and writing the story? Very hostile in the beginning, because um, they'd had magazine writers, private detectives, FBA, FBI, uh, TV producers all over that town. I got there about a year after it happened. Um, and they felt that they'd been grossly, the privacy had been invaded, they'd been misrepresented. In any event, they were hostile to anybody that they didn't know. Um, and so I had doors slammed in my face. I had shotguns pulled on me like Dell and another person's separate incident. Um, my tires were slashed. It was very aggressive. Um, and you know they're not they're not sophisticated people. They're farmers. They're high school graduates. And I think they mistakenly believed that if they shut up, they could kill the story. 
and it just they made could. it worse. They just made it more of the, They just made it yeah. more of the story, you know. So, but eventually, I, you know, I hung around and made some connections with some of the some of the guys uh, in the town, and eventually ended up living with a farm family, and he was one of the more respected farmers in the area. So that gave me a fair amount of credibility. And all four sons ran in different groups and the wife had all her friends. And so they all kind of vouched for me and started saying, well, you ought to call second test. And I said, well, would you call them first and see if it's, you know, give them your, give them your recommendation. So it kind of spread out from there. It was just a real stroke of luck that, that I happened to connect with this family. I don't know how else I would have done it, but, they were interwoven into every thread in, in the community. And they ended up being, you know, extremely helpful and calling friends, calling everybody and saying, talk to this guy, talk to this guy. So it was about three years, three to four years I lived out there to get it. That's the story. Wow. So now, were they ever, the, the shooters, the two people that you think shot him? Were they ever worried about some sort of repercussion from, like, Trina or his brother or anything like that? Um, Do you think? I don't think they were worried. I don't think Mc- I, Clement is, you know, he's a hothead. I don't think he's the sort to worry about that. Um, Trina was, was way too, she wasn't a threat. He, But there was a, a threat for a while. It was a son of his from the first marriage. And he had moved out to California with one of McElroy's sisters, but he was still part of the family. And there were threats that there were rumors that he was going to come back into town with a motorcycle gang and uh, square the square the deal. But uh, there was never any McElroy's. They wrote letters. That's true. They wrote letters to the editor defending him and how the town had ganged up on him and all that sort of blamed him for everything that he didn't do. So forth, but there was never any counter movement uh, that 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 I ever saw like against uh, the shooters or their families. So you, now you were saying that um, it wasn't really a, a town ganging up or vigilante in that way, like a town doing it. But by them being silent and not uh, testifying to what they saw, isn't that in a way? Kind of being, um, a, a, you know, a, a vigilante. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, certainly a crime in a way, um, or or participation in an illegal act. Let's say that uh, it's a, it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of silence, and um, in the sense that it's a group act. Yes, but they never they never got together said, let's don't talk. They never got together and say, okay, you guys say you jumped down between the pickups and you guys say you went behind the building and all that sort of stuff. As far as I could tell, the witnesses almost never talked about it. Um, I'm sure, I know I know people who saw it who never told their wives what they saw or their kids. It was this kind of intuitive understanding that they had automatically that they were not going to be involved in the prosecution of the killers because the killers had taken care of a problem that law enforcement could not take care of. And so the huge injustice would be uh, bringing the killers to bear. What was kind of the response to the book and even the movie? And now there's a, a mini series kind of on, uh, on, on, uh, Sundance. Oh, I Sundance. One channel. Yeah. Yeah, Sundance. Um, wh- what do you think the response is? Do you think people think he deserved it in general, or do you, do you think it's more of a they're upset at the town? Well, back, back at the time that it happened, I mean, a lot of those people are dead now. Uh, but the, the main response was uh, it, it was kind of bifurcated. I mean, one woman said it to me with great clarity. She said, you know, the guys who did it, deserve a medal for doing it. They deserve to be strung up for the way they did it. In other words, doing it mm. in broad daylight in the middle of town as you sat in this truck and full of 50 people, how stupid could you be? Yeah. And um, 
that there was a lot of condemnation of him, uh, critical of him for that, but not not for not for doing it. I mean, you have to realize how scared that town was of him and how he was running loose with weapons. And you know, whoever took care of that danger was not going to be you know they were not going to be a part of turning them in. Um, some of the women worried about his kids. I heard a couple, well, yeah, what about his children and that sort of stuff. But by and large, they they thought it's unfortunate that it happens. Unfortunate that the New York Times is running around the main street. Um, and Maury Schaefer is running around the main street taking pictures of everything. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we didn't have a choice. That's that's the, Now, you know, most of those people are gone. And the people that are now are either their kids or people that have moved there. So it's a much less uh, harsh, uh, it's not quite the right, much much less intense, harsh reaction. You know, they still, still say he got what was coming, but they don't have the fire in their voice when they say it. Mm-hmm. And, and how are um, McElroy's kids? Are they still in the area? Uh, a lot of them are. A lot of them are in other parts of Missouri, Springfield, Kansas City, Cameron. Uh, I speak with uh, occasionally with some of the kids. I, I can't identify them. They don't want me to identify them. Um, and, they, you know, it's been a struggle to get on with the rest of their life and have a normal life. Um, and the boy, Juarez McElroy, uh, son of Alice Wood, who as I, was one of the two women living out at the ranch on that it was killed. He went pretty bad. Uh, he got in a gunfight in St. Joe's, same bar that McElroy had, had gotten in a gunfight with, uh, and was charged and convicted with the felony, and they ended up in prison. Um, he used McElroy's lawyer to get him off, but the lawyer couldn't do it. He went to jail. And he came out, and uh, from what I understand, he's a born-again Christian now. Uh, but Trina remarried. She took her kids. She had three kids by him. She moved down to, um, name it's on the, it's just across the border in Arkansas. And it's um, in the Ozarks. And uh, she started life all over again. She was only about 24 by this time, 23, and she got married and had a whole other family and really seemed to pull out of it as, as amazing as that might be to, to see. But, you know, a lot of these kids just keep their heads down. They don't want people to know particularly that they're a McElroy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, was that lawyer really that good, that Richard McFadden? Was he really that good or was it was it just kind of portrayed? Um well, his records show that he that he was. Now, of course, he didn't get him off on that last one. Um, the the witness held, Bowen Camp held, but he, you know, he was he was right up on the line. I mean, he knew exactly what he could do and what he couldn't do, and be ethically uh, correct. And he hired a lot of private detectives and sent them out into the countryside, and lo and behold, they came back. A week later, with two witnesses saying they'd seen McElroy a hundred miles away when this crime was when this crime was committed, and just or or witnesses just didn't show up. As I was saying, they just they just went away. And um, but he kind of got a he, he was able to create another side to a lot of these. Um, and I think I, whether he knew the truth or where these witnesses were coming from and. I don't know. I'm sure he said, don't tell me this, you know, just tell me your story. But he was a country lawyer with a kind of a charm, you know, I have to say. He was really looking forward to, hmm. you know, at one point Trina sued the town uh, for wrongful death. And he was really jacked up over that because he thought it would be a trial. As a trial, I, I mean, it would, there'd be a trial, and the point of the trial was going to be who killed because she sued the Clements and the town. And uh, it would have been a national, it would have been like O.J. I mean, it had all the elements. Now, it didn't have a celebrity, but the story was so compelling. You know, it had been picked up by all the major networks. 
Well, he was all, I think he even picked out a new suit for himself. And Trina decided to settle for 40,000 bucks. <laughs> it was really hard for him to accept. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, she just wanted out of it. She was moving out of it by then. And I think she was down in Arkansas and maybe she met this guy. And she just, uh, you know, the thrall that McElroy held her in, um, it had, had evaporated by then. And, and cause he got, you know, she was 12 years old, 12 to 13, and she wasn't really formed by that point. And, and he, you know, had control and power over her as she grew into adulthood. And she was starting to shake it off. And she started to think, do I want to spend, you know, the next five years as McElroy's widow, you know, and going through all these there'll be movies and books and all that sort of stuff. So she just pulled back, I think, um, from the whole thing. And, and McFadden said, well, I'll get you 40000 bucks." She said, okay. So so what do you hope people um, come away with when they read the book? Well, it's an interesting question because um, you always wonder how much of your subjectivity influences what you're writing. And... I started off, I have to say, pretty early on with a kind of a working hypothesis that, the, that, the, that it wasn't that he had it coming, but the town generally felt that it had no choice. Uh, the other side of that hypothesis is that the legal system had completely abandoned them. It wasn't controlling. I mean, if I had found evidence contrary to that, I would have varied it. But all I found was evidence that kind of confirmed that so, um, in that sense, the book is fairly sympathetic to the town. It, it doesn't say McElroy had it and they were right and killing him and all that sort of stuff, but it, it does tell their story. And a huge part of the story is the reign of terror he put on them. So, and I would get challenged. I mean, I, I was either on Oprah or Larry King, one of them said, or I think it was Larry King said, uh, well, I don't think murder outside the law is ever right. And I said to him, what if it was your 12-year-old daughter and he was following home on the school bus and taken down to St. Joe and checking into a motel for four or five hours? How would you feel then, Larry? Um, the self-righteousness of people who judge the town does annoy me um, because they're doing it without, they're just, they're, they're kind of self-righteous, they're kind of, in enjoying finding someone who they can condemn for something. I mean, it really is a situation where you have to be in their shoes. So to get back to the question, it's like, um, I think to me as the author, the more, I don't want to say confused, but the more uh, people question um, the legal system and how it breaks down and how people can take advantage of it, and morally, when it is right, if it's ever right, to take the law outside of it. Um, those sorts of questions, if you can stimulate people to think about that and wonder what they would do in that situation, from an author's point of view, that's what's satisfying. Wow. So now, do you have a website that people can find you on, or do you not do that? Yeah. No, no I have a website. It's uh, Harry McLean. It's M A C. L-E-A-N uh, dot com. Perfect. Now we're, we'll put, I've got that book and the other books and you know, all the information. Fantastic. We'll have that on our website as well as your book so people Great. listening can just do one click and uh, pick up the book. Again, our guest has been the author of In Broad Daylight, Harry McLean. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Harry. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.